This week we're going to start off our marker rendering series with a look at Scott Robertson's How to Render. We'll diverge quite heavily from the book as the series goes on, but I thought this was a great launching point to start off. I highly recommend this book, as well as all the other Design Studio Press books, so if you like what we're discussing today, definitely consider purchasing it. The link will be below. With that said, let's get into the lesson. In order to understand rendering, you need to have an appreciation for the value scale. As I've mentioned in a previous video, the scale is from light to dark and can be broken down into 10 increments, as is the Copic marker set. A good rule of thumb for rendering a form is the halfway to black rule, or that the shadow side of a form will be halfway between an object's local value, which is the value under ambient light, and black. There are many lighting situations we can replicate when rendering, but it's a good idea to try to demonstrate a 1, 2, 3 read on an object. In this situation, our light is a direct light, above and to the left, which creates a top face that is the brightest, a two side that is slightly darker in value, and a three side that has a halfway to black value. So to demonstrate these two principles, I'm going to create three different blocks under the same lighting conditions, but with three different local values. Although I'm doing this digitally, the actual mechanics of how I'm rendering is exactly the same as how I would do it with a Copic marker. I'm starting by vertically hatching in my two and three sides with a value of two. I leave in that graininess and texture that shows up as a result of the overlapping marks. You can even use the same marker to make the value darker by filling in some of those spaces. We can take advantage of this by creating a gradient from dark to light as we head towards the bottom of the box. The value at the bottom will be lighter due to reflected light from the ground surface. So our second box has a local value of 5, so I start by hatching this value in. Again, adding in that second layer of marks darkens that value and helps create that gradient towards the bottom. Remember that that gradient comes as a result of light that's bouncing from the ground plane onto the box. Notice that I'm fairly organized with the way I'm hatching. I lay in a base value with vertical strokes, and then fill in some of those spaces with diagonal marks. With traditional markers, you can blend in or soften edges by using a marker of a lighter value. And also note that the three side of this box has a darker value than the cast shadow on the white surface. Now I'm creating a box with a local value of 8. As we head towards the darker values, the range that we have to work within becomes increasingly limited, and as such, smaller value shifts are much more noticeable in darker areas. Again, leaving some space between those marks helps create a gradient to represent the bounce light. And again, the cast shadow has a much lighter value since it's on a white surface. Assigning values can be somewhat tricky, but the general principle is that as the light becomes increasingly perpendicular to a surface, it becomes increasingly illuminated. With the opposite being true, the more parallel a surface is to the direction of the light, the less illuminated that surface will be, and thus it will have a darker value. So let's talk about how we can project cast shadows from a form. First, let's see how we can cast a shadow from a two-dimensional object. I start by placing in the object, in this case a vertical line, and then a shadow direction line. I create a third line which is the angle of the light, and where that intersects with the shadow direction line is where the cast shadow will end. And that's generally the principle of casting shadows. Repeating these steps with each of the four vertical lines in a cube will allow us to cast a shadow of a three-dimensional object, and it's how I derived the cast shadows for the previous cubes. When a light source is close to an object, also known as local light, the angles of light radiate out spherically. I create a vertical line from the light source to the ground plane, extend that through the bottom vertices of my sticks to create my shadow direction lines, then I create lines emerging from my light that intersect with the top vertex of each stick. I extend each light ray until it intersects the shadow direction line, and this intersection marks the end of the cast shadow. Sometimes cast shadows are projected onto nearby objects or walls. In this scenario, we can find how our cast shadow will be projected by taking our shadow direction line and following the contour of the object itself. Here I'm placing in my shadow direction line in red so you can see this in action. Once that's in place, I again project my light ray until it intersects the shadow direction line, casting my shadow. Now let's take a look at how we can cast the shadows of various primitives and how we can render each one of them. Once I sketch in my cylinder, I create a crosshair on top going to the left and right vanishing points. I create verticals wherever the crosshair intersects the perimeter line, and it's these verticals that we'll use to cast shadows much as we did in the previous examples. The two ground plane lines heading towards the right vanishing point that are intersecting those verticals will be my shadow direction lines, 
I'm drawing in the angles of light in red, and where that intersects the shadow direction line is where a cast shadow will be projected. Where my shadow direction lines lie tangent to the bottom face will be my terminator, or the area at which the shadow ends. Now you might not be able to see it depending on the brightness of your monitor, but I'm laying in a cylinder in a very light value. Once I've reconstructed the same exact steps we just did, I lay in value on the vertical face using vertical hatching. We're still trying to emphasize that 1, 2, 3 read, so the top face will be the brightest, the front will be slightly lower in value, and as we head past the terminator we'll go into shadow. Again using the halfway to black rule, the darkest value will be a 5, since our local value is a 0. Rounded forms exhibit a core shadow near the terminator, which is where our darkest value will be. As the form turns away from us at the right edge, it will be receiving more reflected light, and thus will be slightly lighter in value. Where the cylinder makes contact with the ground will be an occlusion shadow, where most of the light is blocked. The value here can be darker than the halfway to black value. The point at which the shadow ends is known as the terminator, and at this terminator is the core shadow, which is the darkest value. Now we'll project a cast shadow from the cone, which is very similar to the cylinder. The key difference is that we only need to project one shadow direction line from the center point. We then connect the angle of light intersecting the tip to that shadow direction line, and from there project two tangent lines to the circular base. Unlike the cylinder, the cone's terminators are not located 180 degrees from each other, and they taper in towards the top. So now let's do another rendering. All the steps will be the same as described previously. I'm using the smudge tool to soften some of these edges, but if you're working traditionally, use a marker of lighter value. Here I'm indicating the passive highlight, meaning that it doesn't move when the observer moves. We'll talk about active highlights when we discuss specular or reflective surfaces. Now I'll show you the rendering setup for a sphere. I create an ellipse with a vertical minor axis, and then use the same crosshair as we did in the cylinder. From each of these four points I create a vertical line. Since in this example the angle of light is completely vertical, there's no need for a shadow direction line. The terminator lies along an elliptical path where the angle of light is tangent to it. In this case, since the angle of light is completely vertical, it lies tangent to an ellipse with a vertical minor axis. And now you see in this rendering, I'm creating that shadow along that elliptical path with a vertical minor axis. Alright, so now let's try to apply some of these principles to a vehicle sketch. There will be a vehicle and man-made object sketching series coming soon, but you can always refer back to the Becoming a Gee series for a few traditional examples of vehicle sketching. The general principle is just to place in your major forms in perspective, in a very simple fashion. Then in a heavier line weight, punching out some of the forms and placing in your final details. I actually avoid placing in too heavy of lines in this demo, because I wanted the forms to stand out from one another using the lighting rather than heavy lines. You'll see though that once I start placing in my lighting information with the markers, that I end up going back and adding some lines afterwards. <laughs> 
Doing the heavy cast shadows in black ink is a little bit of an exaggeration, but I find that it helps separate out the forms a lot. Now I start placing in my values with the markers. Since the local value of the rubber is pretty dark, I start by hatching in with a 5. I've already decided that the lighting source is above and just slightly behind the car, which is why my cast shadows are projected near vertically to the ground. Using this lighting setup, you can use the techniques we've discussed for rendering cylinders, and you'll find that the terminator of each wheel is at the tangent line between the cylinder and the angle of light. I take advantage of the texture resulting from my marker hatching to demonstrate the dirtiness on the wheel. Now this isn't the most accurate rendering, but you can already see that I'm using the markers to show the 1-2-3 read of each form. Here again, I'm exaggerating some of those cast shadows with a really dark value. And then I'm adding in some value to demonstrate the weathering of the paint surface. Now I'm adding in some of the lettering on the truck, which you could do with gouache if you're working traditionally. And as it turned out, I was actually working in color the whole time, but I desaturated it for this video. In the next part, we'll cover specular or reflective surfaces and materials. And if you like that video, please subscribe and consider supporting the channel on Patreon. We have a lot of cool rewards, like access to the archive of full-length livestreams, as well as group lessons. I'll be live streaming every Saturday and Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so be sure to check those out. And if you'd like to learn from me in person, consider taking one or three of my classes at Brainstorm School.